Okay, so in three, two. Good afternoon. My name is Rod McMillian, and I now call to order the January 12th, 2022 meeting of the Audit Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. Today's Audit Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams Live on the BCPS website. In order to conduct this meeting by virtual means, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. The committee will be convening a closed session this afternoon to discuss personnel. As a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Jamison or Ms. Barr if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Pasteur. She's on mute. I am. I'm having drama. I'm sorry. I'm here. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? Here. Mr. McMillian? Here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. A quorum being present, we, we will begin. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll of the staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens. Present. Ms. Manna. Present. Mr. Fletcher. Present. Mr. Street. Ms. Sample. Present. Ms. Crew. Present. Mr. Spore. Present. Mr. Edwards. Present. Are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? Hearing no additional names, I turn the meeting back to you, Mr. McMillian. Thank you. We will now proceed with the agenda as published with the following modification. The new business will be discussed before unfinished business. Additionally, the OLA update will be provided as part of the mid-year update. Item number two, approval of minutes. The live video footage of our last meeting represents the minutes of the meeting. The minutes stand approved as recorded. Item number three, new business. Ms. Barr, please proceed with your mid-year report. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Good afternoon, committee members. We appreciate the opportunity to provide you with our FY22 mid-year update. This update provides information related to our office's activities from July 1, 2021 through December 31, 2021, and will include any audit reports that were issued during this period. Also provide you with a status of current audit projects and a list of planned audits that we have not yet started. And I just wanted to remind everyone that any start and completion for each audit project is truly an estimate because there are circumstances that might delay project begin dates or report issuing dates, um, such as delays in receiving data, the number and the nature of the findings, and additional discussions with management to demonstrate the validity of our findings. Um, additionally, I wanted to call to your attention, and as we have mentioned before, as we are progressing with the completion of our entity-wide risk assessment, some projects um, have been identified and have become more critical to complete than others. And so we have created a shift in our project prioritization. And you will note that we indicated um, a reevaluation and, and possible reprioritization for the certain Q3, uh, quarter three projects. Also wanted to uh, remind folks that our audit reports are posted to our website and that through these committee meetings, we do provide regular updates related to all of our projects. And at any time, we are happy to respond to any questions that you may have throughout um, the year related to our audit activities. Also wanted to call to your attention that PowerPoint presentations that will provide more detailed information for specific projects in our update have been posted to uh, board docs. And that I also want to make folks aware that we issued our FY22 mid-year update report related to investigations under a separate cover. So I just wanted <clears throat> to make uh, folks aware with respect to some of the general information related to our audit activities. I'll now go to the um, FY22 mid-year update and the first audit activity listed in our um, 
update is related to the fraud, waste and abuse hotline and administration. And for that, I will call on Mr. Fletcher to provide that report. Thank you, Ms. Barr. And I am actually going to share that report. So give me one second here. OK, is that report up now being shared with everyone? Yes. OK, thank you. So as Ms. Barr said, um, this is the mid-year report uh, for the Fraud, Waste and Abuse Hotline. And we'll scroll down as we, we get into the details. So as we talk about this, keep in mind this information is from July 1st of 2021 through December 31st of 2021. So it covers those first two quarters. Uh, and as we get down here into the actual data, uh, first we're going to talk about the cases that we received through uh, our, our hotline. And during that period, we received 58 cases. And as you see, we kept 24 of those cases um, to investigate within the Office of Internal Audit. Eight of those were referred to BCPS management for their investigation. And then 26 of the new cases uh, we're not in the purview of the hotline, so they were actually closed with memo to file. And typically when we close those, uh, we, we still provide case details to the applicable uh, management areas and allow them to see what came in through the hotline and, and if um, anything they can do, uh, they can certainly do that. But we do not request any information back from them in those instances. This is just a small breakdown, this table here, of, of those cases that came in through the hotline. Uh, again, we, we said we have 58 total, and you can see we broke them down here by quarter. So we received 27 cases in the first quarter and then 31 in the second quarter. And of those that we actually kept within the Office of Internal Audit for our investigation, you can see that we also then broke them down here. And so we kept 24 cases total and the breakdown uh, of, of each of those cases are here um, between conflict of interest, falsification of records, payroll fraud and overtime abuse, and then misuse of company of property, uh, theft and employee behavior. And so that is this table here in table one. As we scroll down, go into table two, we're actually going to start talking about all those cases uh, in addition to the cases we already had uh, to begin that period. And when we talk about beginning the period, these would these are the cases that were open uh, at the beginning of the fiscal year. Uh, so they were open as of June 30th um, of 2021. And so once we factor that in, again, talking about the 58 cases here that we received uh, in FY22, we have those broken down here. Um, but then again, we had those that we were already open uh, at the beginning of the fiscal year. So we put those together. That gives us 104 cases uh, that were open at some point during uh, the first two quarters of, of FY22. And the second part of the table here talks about what we have closed. So of those 104 cases that have been open during that period, we actually have closed 88 of them. Um, and you'll see the breakdown here. We have our substantiations here uh, in the second table. And so of the internal audit investigations, uh, at, at one point, 41 were actually open. We've closed 29. And so as of 1231, we have 12 remaining cases uh, open. And then again, you can see the same here for management investigations and memo to file. So as of 1231, uh, we had 16 cases open, 12 were internal audit investigations, two were management investigations, and then two were memo to file. Our next table uh, is actually a breakdown. So our next three tables are gonna be a breakdown of, and I scroll back up here, are gonna be a breakdown of these three areas here, the internal audit investigation, the management investigation, and the memo to file. And um, when you have the opportunity, you can certainly read through these tables, but it gives you just detail of uh, what the, the current status is of each of the cases in each of those uh, categories. So for the Office of Internal Audit Investigations, that's here in table three. You'll see that, that we have all of these cases here. We do have them separated by the closed cases are first, listed first. So of the uh, uh, cases here. You can see them all uh, that we have through that are closed. And then as we said before, we have 12 open and those are here at the bottom of this table. Uh, 
and so certainly encourage you to go through and and um, uh, take a look at any of those details that that um, that we have included here. Then our next table is same exact um, setup, except these are investigations that we have referred to management uh, for them to review and then provide response back to us. Uh, again, these are all of our closed that we have up top. And then we have two uh, that were open as of 1231. And then the final table is for the memo to file summary. And again, uh, just a listing of all of those uh, investigations that came through the hotline that we closed with a memo to file. And so I have all of those here. And then our last uh, cases listed are the two that are remaining open. And Ms. Barr, that is our, our presentation for our fraud, waste, and abuse hotline. Is there any discussion on the work group update? Excuse me, did I, I got this, I'm sorry. Are there any discussion on the mid-year report? For investigations, Mr. McMillian. Okay. Any discussion, Ms. Pastor? No, sir, thank you. Ms. Rowe? Um, are we going to be uh, getting these reports to read them, the individual ones? Yeah, uh, yes, Ms. Rowe, to answer your question, I have had a, a technical glitch, but they are in the queue and ready to go. I was trying to get them out to you prior to the um, to this meeting, but I'll try to work on that either later this evening or first thing tomorrow morning. Q4 reports are ready to go um, from last year. Q1 and Q2, I'm still waiting to hear back from um, HR and the law office as to which ones are, are able to be released to the board. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we're going to move on to item four, unfinished business. Oh, uh, excuse me, yes. Mr. McMillian. Mr. I'm McMillian, sorry. excuse me. We have, uh, I'm going through the entire um, mid year report, and as part of the mid year update, there will be sub reports. So um, uh, the first part of our mid year update related to the fraud, waste, and abuse hotline. But what I've done is I have our work plan. So for each item in the work plan, I'm going to go through and give an update and in some instances um, uh, Ms. Manna and or Mr. Fletcher or Ms. Stevens will provide additional information. So as I go through we might pause and uh, Ms. Manna will, will have some PowerPoint presentation actually for the very next item which is the entity-wide risk assessment. So um, in general for the second quarter we assessed and rated and identified additional risks and we held uh, 22 meetings with 32 representatives from three different divisions within the organization. And Ms. Manna has much more detail related to that, Mr. McMillian, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to her. And I believe Mr. Fletcher is going to uh, assist her with uh, her presentation. Thank Fine. you. Fine. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Barr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Corns. I was just going to ask if you were presenting or if I needed to. OK, yeah, perfect. Second slide is good. So uh, this slide may look familiar, but I wanted to provide again an overall purpose and update of what a risk assessment provides. Um, this uh, we are conducting a risk assessment to identify and analyze the key business functions and situations that could negatively impact BCPS, its students, employees and other assets. A risk assessment also determines where audit resources should be prioritized and spent so that efforts are focused on the areas where there is greater risk. This process will help BCPS by identifying the high risk areas and it will also help guide our internal audit plan for the projects that we should be completing um, in upcoming uh, fiscal years. Okay, you can get to the next slide please. This risk assessment process started with our core team having discussions with the chiefs and all of the divisions. And now we are currently working our way through all of the, all of the uh, divisions and speaking with executive directors, department and office heads and other levels of management. The meetings we're currently having with management are to review and determine each department and office's objectives, identifying the potential risks that may exist in those departments and offices, and also identifying the controls that are in place to help mitigate those risks. 
then we're also starting some discussions and thinking about what functions and processes are owned within each department and office because that will be our core uh, audit universe that we go back to to determine the risks associated for the audit activities. As Andrea Barr mentioned, um, we currently have held 22 meetings with over 30, 33 people for these risk assessment discussions. Um, we have more scheduled within the next few weeks and we plan to get some more on our calendars as well. Uh, we had to adjust our plan a, a little bit to accommodate the schedules of some central office staff that has been assisting in the schools over the next few weeks as well. But we're just working around getting to uh, personnel that is available to have these discussions and then coming back to the other personnel that aren't available right at this time. OK, next slide, please. This slide is an example of the objective, what we're calling an objective risk and control matrix. We send this out to each of the applicable areas when we before the, we meet with them. Um, we used we developed this matrix based off of each office's website and the information that is in the current budget book. And this was used as a guide for our discussion with the executive directors and the other management in those meetings. With this tool at each of the meetings, we discussed their objectives. We identified some potential risks that we thought were there, and they had identified some other potential risks that could be related in their areas. And then we also talked about any uh, controls that are in place to help mitigate those risks. This process helps to identify some of the risk areas and helps us to better understand, especially some areas that we may not have been as involved in in BCPS. So it's a it's a good discussion that we're having with all of the um, management levels. And this is just a, a small piece of of an example of the, one of the matrix that we're using. And next I'll turn it over to Mr. Fletcher. He's going to explain the next steps in our process for the risk assessment and what else we are doing with uh, management level personnel. Thank you, Ms. Mana, and oh, thank you, Mr. Corns. Perfect timing. Uh, so in talking about our next steps, uh, as Ms. Mana mentioned, we are meeting, um, currently meeting with, with uh, department office heads, and what we're focusing on now is really identifying the, the key business processes of functions in each of their areas. And as we do that, uh, what we're attempting to do is complete a scorecard that will allow us to, to effectively uh, gauge the amount of risk that each of those um, uh, processes and areas uh, encounter and face. And Mr. Corns, if you would uh, slide to the, or jump to the next slide for us. So as we go through and complete that scorecard, we're really taking a look at six different risk factors. And I know that we've shared this with you before, uh, but it, uh, it, it it's worth mentioning again. So we have the six factors. It's, it's whether um, each of the key processes are mission critical, regulations related to them, the change in personnel and systems, the complexity of each of the key processes, and then any prior audit observations, and then the actual control environment um, surrounding those, those processes and applications. And so for, for each of the six risk factors, we're taking a look and assessing a risk, whether we're calling it low, medium, or high, and, and you can see here that we, we give definition to each. Um, and what we're in the process of doing is sending information out now uh, to these department and office heads. And Mr. Corns, if you would jump to our, our next slide. Sending information out now that looks similar to this. And again, as Ms. Mana mentioned before, this is really just an example. Um, but for, for each of the specified areas, we'll go through and identify uh, what, what we've um, determined to be key processes or, or, or um, key applications that, that each of the areas are responsible for. And really the, the intent here is to get management's buy-in, not only on what we're identifying as those key processes, but also to get their feedback on the, the risk factors. So how do they feel? Is it high, medium, low? So as we go through and do that, that process, um, they'll provide us with their input and our next steps are really to receive that information back and then incorporate that into our, our uh, risk assessment model. And so with that, 
Uh, I believe that is our last slide. And Mr. McMillian, I turn that back to you for any questions. Is there any discussion on the risk assessment? Ms. Rowe? No, sir. Uh, Ms. Pastor? No, thank you. OK, Ms. Barr? Just one, one thing I would like to point out with the risk assessment, as you can see, it, it is a very uh, time consuming effort uh, that involves several uh, individuals in our office and also the cooperation of several levels of management throughout the organization. We've been very pleased so far with the cooperation that we have received because ultimately that will uh, produce a quality product in the end for us and as we continue to go through this risk assessment i'd like committee members to to um, be reminded that once we've identified and prioritized um, what we think are the highest risks to the organization we will be coming back to the committee uh, to review and seek its approval with respect to the projects and moving forward with specific projects so i just wanted committee members to to keep that in their minds as well as we uh, continue to update you with our risk assessment progress. Thank you. Yes, the next um, audit activity is our, our carryover projects uh, from the prior fiscal year. And uh, we did complete the UHY corrective action plan. We actually issued our final report related to that on November 17th. And we identified uh, the recommendations that were implemented and what um, corrective actions were still outstanding and also provided new information with respect to um, observations that we made throughout that process. Uh, that report will be, if it's not posted out on the website, it will be soon. I think we were having some a little bit of difficulty there as well, but I, I think that that will be out on the website soon if it's not already out there. Um, and then with the OLA corrective action plan, as Mr. McMillian mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, we're uh, wrapping that into um, this mid-year update. And for that, I will turn that over to Ms. Mana to provide some additional detail. Thank you, Ms. Barr. This will be a, a verbal update for this month. Um, we have completed the follow-up activities and monitoring for all of the 11 findings in the OLA report. We are currently finalizing the follow-up report and we'll be sharing it with applicable management shortly here. We wanna do that first and then we will um, then have a final follow-up results that will be, is planned to be presented in more detail at the February audit committee meeting. But overall, our preliminary assessment of the implement, implementation status of all of the corrective actions to address the recommendations of the 11 findings are as follows. There's uh, two that have been implemented three that are considered no longer relevant because these are IT related and determined to be um, no, no longer relevant because due to the cyber attack. The structure of the systems have changed and uh, most of the system controls have changed and therefore these findings have, have then been mitigated. And the remaining six are either in process, partially implemented or will not be implemented. But again, as I said, we'll go into more detail of all of those findings at uh, the next audit committee once um, the political management has had the opportunity to review our draft report. Um, as previously reported um, in a prior month, there were three OLA findings that were very similar to UH findings, and we noted that in the follow-up report, the correlation and, and reference between the two. Um, so therefore, we, we plan to communicate and present more details of the 11 findings next month um, after the follow-up draft report is shared with management. That is it for my update. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next audit activity is uh, peer review preparation. And in the second quarter, quarter we obtained more uh, resources related to the Red Book, and we had additional staff register uh, for the ALGA Red Book peer review team. So we are waiting to hear back for some assignments related to that so that we can get our feet wet with respect to what to expect uh, when we have our peer review conducted and also we have um, developed a plan, a more structured plan to update our op operations manual to make sure that it is in accordance with Red Book. Um, 
got a lot of good information from some uh, local counties and some uh, external uh, other external school systems. So we're getting a lot of good information to help us structure our our um, manual. We continue to hold our weekly project status meetings, uh, monthly staff meetings, attend Board of Education uh, meetings, and um, of course, audit committee meetings. The staff continues to um, listen in on the other Board of Education committee meetings as well. And monthly meetings were held with the superintendent and general counsel and business services executive leadership. Uh, Ms. Manna and Mr. Fletcher attended the work group meetings related to the efficiency review, and we'll talk about that a little bit more um, later on in the agenda. We continue to attend uh, professional development professional development activities to obtain relevant CPE for our licenses and certifications, continue to monitor our, our budget and um, move forward with new software acquisition related to our, our work papers and um, looking at and and um, reviewing and and uh, making sure that SOPs that are in place are still relevant and identify those that are, <clears throat> excuse me, still outstanding. In our follow-ups that we completed in the second quarter, we finished the review of the high school money handling procedures. We did two of the seven school activity fund and procurement card follow-ups. We completed the Office of the Superintendent non-salary expenditure review follow-up and we issued that final report on um, December the 22nd. And we have uh, a work in progress is the Board of Education non-salary expenditure review follow-up. Now, Ms. Mana has some additional information related to the money handling procedures and um, Ms. Stevens will have some additional information related to the non-salary expenditure review. Ms. Mana. Thank you. Mr. Corns, do you have that um, PowerPoint slide presentation? Ms. Mana, my apologies. That's uh, I okay. have several. Which one do you need now? The money handling? Money yes. handling. I'm sorry. Yes, please. No, no worries. Uh, give me one sec, ma'am. And you can go to the second slide, please. Thank you so much. So in fiscal year 20, we reviewed the money handling procedures at all 25 of the high schools to ensure that they had all of the required elements that the Office of Accounting uh, suggests that, that the schools have in their procedures. We also inquired regarding the communication of the procedures to the school staff, just making sure that they're communicating them annually to the people who collect the money and making sure that um, that they have the right processes and procedures in place for training that's um, offered to, to the staff. Um, at the 25 schools, there were 12 that had findings with their money handling procedures. You can advance to the next slide, please. The objective and uh, scope of our follow-up to these reviews was to see if the findings identified in the prior audits, our prior reviews have been resolved. We also looked, because the Office of Accounting's current guidelines were revised, we were making sure that the current money handling procedures at these schools actually comply with the revised procedures in the Office of Accounting. And we worked with the schools to ensure that they were using the most updated procedures. There were, uh, since there were 12 schools in the prior audit that had um, missing elements from their procedures. We reviewed all of those schools. Four of them actually were schools that were already, we were already doing a chip review. And in the scope of that audit includes looking at the current money and procedures as well. And then we did a follow up at the other eight schools just for the money handling procedures. In the next slide, please. But at all 12 of the schools, the follow up results are um, determined to be that they were resolved. So they had all of the money handling procedures included, um, all the missing elements that were in there, and they also complied with the Office of Accounting's new procedures. Like I had said, we uh, we worked with the schools. Some of them made the revisions to ensure that they were compliant with old, with some other 
procedures, but we made sure that they were using the most up to date current procedures that Office of Accounting sends out to the schools. But they, this was good news that they were all compliant with with the money handling procedures. And that's it unless there's any questions. Otherwise, I believe Miss Stevens has an update. I've got a question and but before I ask my question, uh, sure. Miss Pastor, any questions? No, no, thank you, Mr. Miss Rowe. No, thank you. I'm just curious when you have the number 25 high schools, are you including Sellers Point in that number? Yes. OK, that is one you. of our schools that we review to. Yeah. OK, thank you. You're welcome. OK, well, this is Debbie Stevens. I'm going to give you an update on our follow up to the Board of Education non salary expenditure review. This is just going to be a verbal update. We are still in process with that project. Uh, the original review report was issued uh, October 5th of 2020. Um, in that report, there were seven results that we identified. Um, our current audit period is December 1st of 2020 through November 19th of 2021. Um, we are very happy to report that four of the seven um, results have been resolved and things are looking really great there. Um, we do have a few unresolved issues. Um, there is still instances of confirming purchase orders being used. Um, we did have two purchase requisitions that were processed um, significantly um, later than when the exp expense was incurred. Um, we also have uh, an expense that was incurred in FY20, but was paid with FY21 funding. And um, the board's operating budget um, has been overspent in both FY21 and FY22. Um, so in FY21, it was 167% spent, and at this point, as of today, um, it's at 118% spent. And that is primarily almost um, solely due to the um, expense that's related to legal services fees. So um, the budget in FY21 for that was about $2,700 and the actual expenditures were um, almost $75,000. Uh, again, in FY22, there was no budget for it and in the actual so far has been almost $30,000. So um, we noted that legal fees are being paid um, both to Carney, Callahan, Bresler, Bennett and Shear and also to Royston, Muller, McLean, and Reed. So uh, we plan to meet with the board officers um, very soon to review the results of our follow-up, and we will issue our final report prior to the next audit committee meeting. And that's it for me, if anyone has any questions. Any questions, committee members? I have one. I, mm -hmm. Yes, please, Ms. Rowe. Oh, Ms. Pastor can go first. No, go ahead, Ms. Rowe. I'm okay, so... Spinning. Um, did you, when you did this review for the legal expenditures, did you look into where the revenue for legal expenditures comes in? Because my understanding is that the revenue for legal expenditures is being paid into the law office budget, but the expenditures are coming out of the board budget. And I wanted to know if you had looked at that or reconciled that. And there's also some reimbursable expenses from other departments in the board budget. So in the board budget looks like it's in the negative far more than it is in reality. I am not aware of the revenue coming into the law office. Um, Ms. Barr, are you familiar with that? We can follow up with that. I, I, I again, um, we're looking at the information that is provided in the um, existing financial system and with regard to the budgets that are set up for for the board and um, it, historically there has been a zero budget set up for legal expenditures um, and again if, if you recall um, the audit periods we can check for the audit periods under review to see what the processes are or, or were related to that so that's something that we could follow up on certainly Ms. Rowe. Sure, because one of the things that there's there's always been a zero budget because typically the legal fees for the board were paid out of the law office. And at some point in time, 
um, surrounding the superintendent search or just before that, the expenditures were shifted to the board budget, but the revenue was not. But the revenue does exist in the school system. It's just being paid to the law office. Yeah. So what we end up doing is a bat transfer, and I'm not sure that your audit is reflecting the bat transfers to correct that the revenue is going to the wrong place. The expenditure, you mean? We'll look into it. Uh, yeah, I would appreciate if that were further sure. explored and documented. Certainly, we will do that, Ms. Rowe. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Pastor? Okay, I had questions uh, on the same line, but I'm going to wait uh, since Ms. Barr said she's going to look into it because the money was put over into the board, what, uh, three years ago? Now, I'm, I'm, I would be just incredulous, among other things, at the notion that it has been that way and there's no one who said, hmm, all right, this money needs to be back or or expenditures coming out of the law office and no one is seeing as thorough as this department has been and others that handle uh, fiscal matters. I'm having a difficult time under believing that something else didn't happen that put it since I, I must say 2019 or so. Um, under the board account, but what you uncover will explain all of that. Ms. Rose's question as well as mine. Is that right, Ms. Barr? That's correct. We will explore that and um, that will be included and mentioned in our final report as Ms. Stevens indicated. Uh, and we will uh, schedule an exit conference with you and Ms. Hen and, and Ms. Gover to discuss our, our findings. Uh, that's just our typical normal process and that's what we did with the previous uh, board chair. Well, I hope that that is soon as well as um, all things that are related to Ms. Rose question, questions and mine as well, that that happens with just great speed and alacrity. This is very serious. Thank you. You're welcome. Sure. Ms. Barr, are we ready to move on to item four? We still uh, have... We, have we have a couple more couple okay. more items, Mr. McMillian. We have um, the next audit activity is our special audit request and or unplanned audits. And for the um, second quarter, we actually completed 31 or finalized the completion of 31 change in principle financial reviews. Uh, we have uh, reviewed two uh, blueprint for Maryland future accountability and implementation or AIB board virtual meetings. Uh, one of the meetings they had a PowerPoint that had 99 uh, slides on it. Uh, that was a very long meeting. Uh, we have planned for the Office of Third Party Billing self monitoring and we have completed the confirmation review for the school activity fund investment accounts. Mr. Corns, I believe Ms. Mana is going to present her final um, PowerPoint and it's related to the change in principle or chip chip. I'm not sure how it's labeled for you. I believe is the chip summary. Thank you, Ms. Barn. Yes, this is my final PowerPoint presentation. Um, if you can advance to the second slide, please. As Ms. Barr um, stated that there were th 31 schools that had a change in principle in fiscal year 22, and the audit committee requested internal audit to do some type of activities at all of these schools just to ensure that there were proper transition of, of financial responsibilities. So we did not perform a full complete audit at these schools so that our resources could be in other um, planned project areas. But what we did do, if you can advance to the third slide, please. I believe that shows more of our um, what our purpose was for these chip reviews. We were verifying that the responsibility for the school finances transferred from the um, prior principal to the newly assigned principal. And if there was any assistance that was needed at the at the particular schools either requested or needed we also provided that service if you can go to the next slide please 
So the scope of our review um, included financial documents at each of these schools. We reviewed the financial um, responsibility form that is completed. It's a listing of uh, at least a dozen things that the outgoing principal has to make sure that they transition over to the new principal and they both sign off on, on this form. A lot of times when we do our review, we help this transition and make sure that the new principal is comfortable signing this form and that they have all of the information and financial documents that they should. We also make sure that the bank signature card and document is updated to remove any old um, authorized signers and any new signers are added to that document. There's also a uh, Maryland controller memo sales tax and use form that needs to be sent to the controller. This is notifying them that uh, the sales and use tax um, person in charge has changed and it, it makes that change on their records. And then we also provide the new principal with a current listing of the procurement card holders at the school. This is to ensure that the new principal is comfortable with who all is assigned a procurement card. And if there needs to be any changes or people removed that are no longer there, we help with that transition as well. Um, and as I mentioned in the money healing procedures re review, we, we that's part of the scope of this review as well. We look at the school's current money handling procedures and make sure that they are compliant with what the Office of Accounting suggests they have in their procedures. We also provide the incoming new principal with any um, prior audits, reviews, or follow-ups that were done at that school just to give them a sense of how things were at the school um, for their prior audit whether it was two years ago or five years ago, we provide them with copies of the audits and reviews. And we also provide them with a document that's called a principal's checklist. It's a financial reminder sheet that is helpful to them to review um, monthly or periodically or annually of different financial um, responsibilities that they have. And the next slide, please. So at the 31 schools that we completed these reviews, um, well, 29 of them were just as I spoke with the, the that scope of the review, there were no findings. There was one school that at the request of the executive director, we completed a full school activity fund and P-card audit, and there were 14 findings at that school. That report is not yet posted um, on the internal audit website because it was in our quarter two um, reports that were issued, but they should be, that one should be posted shortly. And there was one school where there were some principal concerns that we assisted with and addressed those concerns and provided some more feedback for that principal. And that is it for the report of all 31 change in principal schools. Any questions, Ms. Rowe? No, thank you for doing that. Ms. Pastor, any questions? Yeah, uh, I concur. Thank you. No questions. Okay, Ms. Barr. Uh, <clears throat> the next uh, audit that we did was related to workers' compensation. And what we did is we assessed the cost containment service provided by our, um, our, our third party vendor. Because if you'll recall, we did an audit last year related to this particular third party vendor. And as part of that, we um, saw some things that didn't quite sit very well with us. So we did an audit related to that. We issued our final report on November 19th, 2021. And I think that's in the process of being posted as well um, to our website. Happy to report that management accepted all of our recommendations and they have provided us with an action plan that they are going to implement to improve internal controls and uh, we will be following up uh, with respect to the um, uh, findings that we had in that report. Our next project, our next project had to do with um, FY21 overtime payments. And uh, in the second quarter, we have obtained preliminary information related to all overtime payments. And um, we're still trying to determine if we're going to be able to do FY21 or if we have to uh, work on FY22 overtime payments. If we have to change our project scope, we will let you know uh, about that. But there, um, you know, there are concerns related to that because uh, Kronos, which is was the swipe system, is uh, no longer um, 
up and running and uh, everything's being tracked manually. So we're looking into that. Um, we also have a project contract review to, to look at all third party administrator contracts um, to make sure that the parties are complying with the requirements set forth in those contracts. So we've identified um, those third party uh, contracts and we've started to conduct some interviews and review some applicable contracts. That's the work that was completed in the second quarter. Um, we started the student data enrollment and attendance project and what we're doing there is we're looking at the controls to um, get a comfort level around the accuracy of the information and the data that is uh, that was posted and moved over into um, into the new system uh, focus. So uh, right now we've conducted preliminary interviews. S the staff with whom we've conducted the interviews are very, very knowledgeable with respect to the old system and the new system. So um, we're getting a sense that uh, controls centrally and in the in the system itself are probably going to be OK, and but we might have to expand our review uh, to go out into the schools and look how they're uh, entering the information, basically the process owners, and that would be something separate from this particular audit. And then um, our final audit activity that we started in the second quarter had to do with IT security, and there's some overlap there between that and um, the risk assessment that that is being completed, but we have done some background research related to IT security and we have obtained some preliminary information related to the existing IT security measures that are in place. So that um, that is a review and an overview of what we have completed so far mid-year with respect to our audit activities. Now we do have a listing of um, planned activities that we have not yet started. And as I alluded to um, in the beginning of this presentation, there are one, two, three projects that um, we're going to reevaluate based upon the risk assessment results that we've obtained so far. And that uh, the first of those three projects is the contract procurement process. So uh, we may combine that with the project that I described, um, which is the audit project number 15 in the contract review for the third party administrators. We may go ahead and combine that with that particular project, but what we're looking there is uh, to assess the BCPS practice for procuring goods and services from the third party entities. So we would be looking at various types of procurements, in, including competitive bids and sole source procurements and, and looking at the um, selection process. <clears throat> The other one that we are going to reevaluate is the fixed asset inventory um, based on the risk assessment results obtained so far that may become a lower priority um, in, in this fiscal year and maybe even moved out to the next fiscal year. And then the um, third one that we are reevaluating and that'll be based on collaboration with Clifton Larson Allen, our external auditors. Uh, relates to the um, findings that they had as a result of the test work that they did for the um, FY21 CAFR. So we'll be um, consulting with them to see if there's anything that we can follow up on or will they be following up um, and, and how, how um, if they're going to be basing their follow up on materiality or things of that nature. So again, those were the three projects that were we are reevaluating or in the process of reevaluating, but we still plan to do the benefits eligibility um, validation in this uh, to begin in this third quarter, as well as uh, payroll controls to begin in the third quarter. And um, we'll be looking at leave balances and the validation of that process. We push that out to the fourth quarter and um, that concludes the overall presentation related to our, our mid-year um, update related to our audit activities and investigations. Committee members, any questions? No, thank you. No, thank you. OK, hearing no questions, we're going to move on to item four, unfinished business. 
Ms. Manna and Mr. Fletcher, please proceed with the work group update. Thank you, Mr. McMillian, and this will actually be a verbal update. Um, <clears throat> this is related to the efficiency review. Um, Ms. Matt and I were asked to participate in a work group uh, to review uh, and evaluate recommendations made in the efficiency review report. Um, and <clears throat> our work group uh, reviewed three recommendations uh, from the efficiency review report. And this was done over a series of five meetings um, and actually our agendas and the minutes from those meetings are on the website link uh, for the efficiency review uh, on the BCPS link. In general, uh, we agreed with the non-personnel related recommendations reviewed by the work group. Um, there were two uh, of the three recommendations that we agreed, but with, with minor modifications. Uh, and so keep in mind with the recommendations, uh, we were given very specific details in, in that we were only revealing um, the, the portions of the recommendation that did not have anything to do with um, uh, superintendent rule board policy or uh, personnel uh, actions or, or, or motions. So um, of the three that we, we did review uh, was recommendation 3-4. Um, that recommendation is actually that BCPS in conjunction with the board audit committee uh, should develop a request for a proposal uh, for the annual audit and select a firm that best meets BCPS requirements in the year before the contract uh, with the current auditor Clifton Larson Allen LLP expires. Uh, so that was something that, that we did. Um, uh, ultimately, the, the work group did agree with with modifications of the language. Um, the, the language being that instead of saying the new audit firm, just the selected audit firm um, would begin their work. And that is within the, the specific timeline uh, of each of those recommendations. Uh, the next recommendation was recommendation 311. Uh, and again, that actually talked about um, uh, the, the recommendation itself. If you read the recommendation itself, it talks about policy 8400. Um, being updated to realign the internal audit function. But within that timeline uh, is specifically addressed and, and um, I apologize, I'm pulling it up now, uh, specific, specifically addressed um, items within, where is it here? I apologize. Uh, I'm sorry, it was talking about um, language that differentiated between investigations and audits. Um, and so when we did, um, do our recommendation for yes, we did do it with yes with modification, asking that there were was clarification there between that, um, between investigation and audits. And then for 312, uh, talk, really spoke about risk management. Um, and it, was, it was more of a operational uh, area. However, we did um, still review everything and the recommendation was uh, yes, and, and we did not have uh, any modifications for that. And so those were the three that we reviewed uh, during those meetings. Uh, and and Ms. Mena, I, I don't know if you have anything you would like to add um, to that, but it was uh, presented to us in a way that uh, we were understanding that it would ultimately be brought uh, to you in front in front of the audit committee uh, for your review as well. That is correct. <laughs> Any questions, committee members? Hearing no questions, I'm going to move on to announcements. Uh, the next meeting of the audit committee will be on Tuesday, February 15th, 2022 at 4.30 p.m. May I have a motion to go into closed session as promoted by the Open Meetings Act as found in the Annotated Code of Maryland General Provisions Article Section 3-305-B1 to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction on any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. So moved. So moved. Uh, and it was seconded by Ms. Rowe. All in favor of closing the meeting, please say yes when your name is called. 
All op opposed, please answer no. Ms. Jameson, please call the roll. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The affirmative has it and the motion is adopted. Also